Okay, call the meeting to order at uh, 6.40. Um, first order of business is public comment. Nathan? Hi guys, thanks for serving. Um, quick concern is that my daughter's playing field hockey and it can be initial information session which was held here in the library and there was a couple from Roxbury who were concerned about their daughter being able to participate because practice is at 4.30 to 6 mm -hmm. and the activities van leaves at 5.10 from the middle school. Um, so I just I want to make sure that's on people's radar and as you know I suspect it's one of those unanticipated inclusion issues but it'd be a shame if the one or two kids who want to participate in sports <laughs> be See that microphone doesn't do anything for right, us. It right. does it for there. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't for the. So the concern is so field hockey practice is 4:30 to 6 every day after yeah, school for middle school. The activities bus going back to Roxbury leaves the middle school at 5:10. So if a student wants to participate in field hockey at the rec fields and make it back in time for the 5:10 bus, they're going to get 20 minutes of practice. Um, that may be only one student, but. Um, Anyway, it's just one of those sort of curveballs that may or may not have been anticipated in the thinking about how this all comes together. But I'm hoping that folks can respond to that and make sure that we're including all Roxbury kids in all activities and getting them home. Thank you. Perfect. Thank Thanks, Nathan. And I, I know that um, Pam is working to make sure that it's, to, as if Pam is, is definitely working to make sure we accommodate Roxbury. Um, so, uh, hi, Steve. Hi. Uh, so as many of you know, unfortunately, uh, Peter Sterling has stepped down from the board, and we want to thank Peter for uh, his, I think, three plus years of great service on the board. Uh, it was, I think, a time of a lot of accomplishments, and he played a large role uh, both uh, up here and uh, working in committees and behind the scenes to, I think, make a lot of, of great things happen. So uh, so we thank Peter, uh, but it also means that we have to replace Peter. Uh, there will be some, uh, I think there's a notice on the website already, um, and I'll send some reminders by social media. Uh, but the, the protocol for replacing uh, a vacancy on the board is that uh, the board replaces uh, that vacant position uh, until the next election. Thinking maybe we, it was a leftover and we no. thought. No, it's, it's a new thing. Okay. It's particular to, to us. It doesn't mean that there are some people in the past who served illegitimately on the board. Did you say confer or confer? Confer. The, the word in the statute is confer. It's unclear what exactly that means. Uh, <laughs> we feel if we get a vote on it, that's about as much conferring as the city council can do. Got it. Okay, so then just to clarify for the audience, so we'll be advertising on the website and this meeting. Will it be in any of the papers? Will the vacancy be posted anywhere else? Uh, we're, not, we're not planning to put it in the papers. We will push it out on social media. The bridge did ask me about it. Yeah. I, I, I gave them the... Yeah. And I have information. Front porch forum, maybe? Okay. We can put it on front porch forum, too. Uh, and I believe Steve Mills has already uh, explained the process in an article. He at least asked me about it. Um, Is there, so there, but I want to be clear because I'm imagining it in the reverse situation where, let's say, a Roxbury member needed to be replaced and there's a, a predominance of Montpelier votes yeah. on this board. So I understand the need for the select board of, of Roxbury to, to confer. Um, but in a case as if it were that, or in this case, what is it fair game for, it's a strict vote, so that means the Roxbury representatives in this case will have their votes on who replaces um, this person, even though it's a Montpelier person. And in, in the other situation, the Montpelier members of the board would, so would, would have the majority vote in selecting the Roxbury person yes. to fill, and, I'm, and that makes sense why the select board would have to yeah, be happy with that. So yeah. I think I'm understanding this, but it's new. Yeah, it's new. Yes. And I okay. think I think that's the that's probably what the legislature had in mind when it put that in. Whereas, you know, if there was a town like Roxbury that's outvoted on the board and they wanted 
you know, say the Montpelier people wanted someone who was maybe from Roxbury, but didn't necessarily represent Roxbury the way Roxbury would want to be represented, then Roxbury could put a great house. Right. But for this case, Roxbury members of this board should feel confident in participating yes. in this it's, process. It says all Excellent. nine members will vote on, well, great. Except me, unless there's a tie. We'll vote uh, on um, an appointment. And Peter, who doesn't belong. Eight members. Yeah. Right. And Peter, Peter, who's no longer on the board, Peter is um, officially doing something else with his Wednesday. Uh, and then I think, is there any, any further questions on that? Can I just ask a clarifying question? Heather's not in the audience. Is anybody taking notes? This oh, evening, um, I told her because we were going in a detective session so far, she's going to watch this part of the meeting on tape, which she does anyway, to, okay. to, to take the notes. So I was just being good. kind to an employee That's who great. worked Thank all day long. Okay. <laughs> uh, but she'll be here after the executive okay, session. Just, any other comments on replacing Peter C? Uh, and then, uh, next item before we go into executive session, I know Heather is patiently waiting. Uh, the consent agenda. Um, do you have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I think we approve the consent agenda. Do you have a second? Including the additional appropriate. All second. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. Uh, now we need a motion to um, go into executive session. So I think first you need the motion that we. Um, the purpose is for advice from our legal counsel. Exactly. So I don't, I don't think we need two motions for that. You can just go straight into executive. We just have to move to go into that. Okay. It's not the one that needs a fine. Do you have a motion to go into executive session? So I'll move to go into executive session. Second. Second. Favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? We're back. On the Judiciary um, Committee to hear the yes, SBAC results Ron presentation Ron from Director uh, Mike I need to leave. So I ran for Lieutenant Governor. I got my passes. He's in Arizona. So I didn't agree. I ran once. Actually, could I have another one? Because she's a great fan. It's okay, give you one. So Judiciary Committee to have some families during the first did you have that properly mic'd? Yes. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, what I have prepared here is just an overview of our SPAC results, um, an explanation of how we're going to use those results to our benefit, and I'll be able to answer any questions you might have. Hopefully. So on the first slide, this is generally how we did in 2017-18. Um, I have the scale over here on the side. This is the percentage of students that got a 1, a 2, a 3, and a 4. Blue is your ELA, and red is your math. So we had about 64% of our students proficient or higher in ELA, and 47% in math. And I'm going to dig deeper into those, but that's, those are the results that go on the paper. That's kind of what everyone sees. And when we talk about SBAC, one of the things that you don't hear a lot about are claims and targets. And claims are generally these broad statements of categories, like writing or reading, that they talk about in SBAC. And when you dig down a layer deeper, there are these things called targets, which are essentially the skills or evidence that we want students to show that they're reaching these common core standards. So when we look at our results, we're able to dig down and see those results, actually quite a great interface with the SBAC assessment to show us what's going on. And for example, in 2017-2018 in ELA, the claim of writing was our lowest area, a place where we need to look at. This is the state comparison. So this is us in the blue. This is the state average. These are preliminary results. So you may see some shifting eventually, but that's what's on there now. You can see we were above the state average in all grades. So in ELA, when we, we looked at claims instead of writing, we dug deeper into the targets, and these are the things that we were doing really well. 
for example. There were more than I could fit on a slide, but this is an example of the information we get. So we know that we're doing pretty well with target 10, word meaning. And it's kind of interesting because a lot of people assume that we're not doing a lot of vocabulary work, and we're, we're doing OK in that. Uh, grade 3, target 11, reasoning and evidence, we're also very strong in that. But it also shows us what we need to focus on. So at target 7, language use, interpret and use language by distinguishing literal and non-literal forms. That's an area where we can focus in a little bit more. And the same with writing, grade appropriate grammar usage, things like that. And that's shown to us at each grade level, so we can really dig deep and see what's going on. These are some more of those target areas by grade level, just some examples. This isn't all of them. But in grade three, here's some areas that we might want to look at. Grade four, grade five, all the way down to nine. This really helps us hone in our professional learning that we're talking about and good discussions. And also helps us look at our local assessment data and understand what we can align and look at. Here's our math scores, same setup as before. So the blue is the us, and the red is the state. We were below the state average in two grade levels, grade three and grade nine. A um, couple things to note, and I talked about this on the next slide as well. This is the first year that we've given it to grade nine. It was grade 11 in previous years. And also, we have an influx of students to the high school in grade nine that haven't been in our system. And the area where we were uh, need to focus most according to this information is concepts and procedures. And I'll dig a little deeper into that in the next slide. Just right. a quick clarifying question. Is that the current grade three and grade nine or is that grade three and grade nine last, last year? year. Nice. So it's current grade four and grade yes. ten. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the timing of the results is always kind of yeah. funky. That's what and I thought, but I just wanted to make sure. Years, so that's a little interesting. Uh, so the math targets, when we dug a layer deeper below those claims, one of our strengths was solving real-world mathematical problems. Uh, this is from grade six. This is my example in grade six. And in grade six, um, one of the areas that we could focus in on was applying and extending previous understandings of number systems. And we have those examples for every grade level. I didn't put them all here, but we are able to get information about what we're seeing that helps really guide our discussions. And clearly, you know, when we have any grade levels, but in math, these were our lowest areas were math. So we want to look at that a little bit deeper. This is our performance over time. Can I? Yeah, absolutely. You're changing the scale on these. We're starting in the 40s on the ELAs and starting at zero on the math. I'm just, I'm getting confused by how we're doing oh, relatively. <laughs> so, so I, yeah, I'm sorry. This is, it just sets it to a fifth basically, essentially, what it does. So it goes, it, it levels to wherever it is. These percentages are the percentages proficient or higher. Right, but if we look at like a 46 versus a 52 in math, and then we look at, I don't know what it is in ELA, but you know, see how you're starting at zeros? Yeah. So it looks like we're pretty close. Yeah. And when you go to the other scale, it looks like we're gapingly ahead yeah, or whatever, yeah, you know? And no, I'm, you're right. I'm just like, wait a minute, we can't be that different than the, than the average, but we're really not. If right. you use a different scale, I'm just being. No, I'm like, it's a very good point. It just looked weird, and now I'm like, okay, now we're not. It's not that different. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, the other thing about this scale is the assumption when you look at it first off is that 100 percent is at the top, and that is not true. Correct. You're only oh, right. at 60 percent. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So again, we were below grade three, grade nine. These are the targets. That we're going to look at um, some of the targets that are more. Yeah. Mike, can I have a backup question? Sure. I just, perhaps I just don't understand. Why, if, if you're testing in 11th grade, you're compared to other 11th graders, and we're now testing at 9th, and we're comparing to other 9th graders, why the difference? Why the drop? Why did they change it? Yeah. Well, not, not the function. Why did they move it from 11 to 9? I understand it. You, you head it sure. at 9, you know more what it is you need to address. I concur with that. But then why are, when, if we do so well compared to other 11th graders, why aren't we doing so well as compared to other 9th graders? Yeah, so there's there's a bit of, I get to that later on when okay. I talk about what we're going to do with this information okay. a little bit, but remind me if I don't answer okay. that question. Okay, all right. Uh, so this is our performance over time. Again, remembering that this was the first year we assessed 9th graders, but our general trend and achievement has been since 2015.
And then we started to look at the subgroups. So we started to look really at those economically disadvantaged, that's the term that the state uses, mm -hmm. economically disadvantaged students. They represent 21% of our total assessed population. 12% of our economically disadvantaged students are on an IEP, and 94% of those students did not achieve proficient. So it's definitely an area where we, we want to look. Um, the red represents below the standard, so 52% of our our economically disadvantaged students were below the standard in ELA, and this will worry for me there, but 66 percent below the standard in that. Wait a minute, it says 94 percent. Oh, IEP. Yeah. Never mind. Thank you. So this is the what next part. So one of the things that we didn't have time to do yet was really dig into those cohorts to answer that question. You know, why are we doing so well at 11th grade and 9th grade looks different? Part of it is I think it does, it shows the growth in high school. Mm -hmm. The other part is Mike um, McGrath and I found out, we had 34 students move into our school in 9th grade last year that weren't in our school system. They were in private schools or homeschooling or, or some other alternative situation. That's not pointing a finger, but it's a contributing factor in the data. So from 8th grade to ninth grade, we had a bump of 34 students that we hadn't assessed the year prior. Well, the other thing is they did not have advantage of the curriculum presented in our school system. That's, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Assuming that was good. Yeah. Uh, we have to look at the scale score analysis. So one of the things that you're going to hear from us in ESSA when we get our report card eventually from ESSA is that they'll be looking at scale scores. And essentially, scale scores will show year to year, a student could get a two in third grade and a two in fourth grade, and it, that doesn't show the growth, but when we look at the scale score, we can see how far students actually grow from year to year. Individual students. Yeah, and cohorts and teams. Yeah, groups. right. Yeah, so, and that's something that's often missed when we just report out on threes and fours. Uh, so that's, that's another layer that we're gonna go into. IAB administration analysis. So there are these um, essentially questions and tasks that you can unpack for students that are really good. It's not teaching to the test, it's not preparing for the test, any of that stuff. They're just really thoughtful problem solving things to work through with kids. And we can gain a lot of information about kids, how kids learn, how our instruction's going through using those. So we're gonna look at those this year. And then more claims and target analysis, really digging in at a deeper level, looking at cohorts, looking at kids, we're a small enough school system that we can really identify these students and figure out what we need to do. Um, so that's the next layer. The second week in September, we didn't get to it. Um, but we're, we're really working on it. Um, and then there's some additional slides and charts. I didn't want to leave Roxbury out, um, even though our results from the previous year don't include them. These are their results for grade three and grade four. We're still going through some stuff with the state, trying to get access to the results and be able to access their information. So this is the best I could do uh, for the moment. But you can see definitely some of the same math concerns. So that aligns with the work that we're doing nicely in terms of the elementary schools. And then these lovely charts are a breakdown of each grade and each achievement level so that you can look at them and kind of pick it apart. You can get really lost in the data. It's really fun. Like Libby and I can geek out for a couple hours if we don't look up. So, um, so these I bars should be represented like as stacks or, or pies probably to give us a better sense because they all add sure. up to 100, right? Each bar, each set of bars adds to 100? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. One of the things that charts like this tell me or jump out at me right away is that we have a roller coaster going on. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. So, so typically, when I see roller coasters like that, I start to ask questions like, our scores on this particular assessment are based on the cohort of kid, not on the teaching, right? So essentially, if our teaching was right where the same in every grade level matched to the targets that we want them to get to, you would see consistency. You would see this. But when it's like this, it's based on the cohort of kid. So so what I question impact then. You know, so we wanna we wanna look at that trend data over the last couple of years and see if that's the same. It's the grade seven cohort that was so strong. Hmm. Were they were they strong in sixth grade and fifth grade as well? You know, is, is that a strong cohort of kid? Um, and why isn't the grade seven, grade six cohort that had such good scores? You know, like what's going on there? But when I see roller coaster scores, that those are the types of questions I ask. Mm -hmm. 
And we're right at the, we're at the question asking stage yeah, right now. Absolutely. We don't know the answers to anything. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for asking the question. Yeah. And those last two are consistent. The top line is fifty percent. Mm -hmm. Yes. Go for it. So I noticed on this on the slide that showed the trend line going down. Mm -hmm. um, it also shows the trend line going down to the state as a whole. And, sorry, so the, and I just wondered if no, 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 these are all of us. No, that's go, go, it's go down ELA, and, ELA and math. Yeah, this okay, is ELA. Okay, so that is just ELA and math. Yeah. ELA and math. ELA and so we're not, so the trend line for the state is not down. Like I'd have to look. Okay. If I, I think for the most part it's static, it's but static. I, I'm not sure. Okay, all right, thanks. That's a, it's a jump. I don't want to, uh, do you have more to go? I don't want to. No, that's okay. okay. Well, so the other piece of this, and as a parent, I am faced with this, you know, testing question every year, you know, the option, you know, do you exercise your, your opt out kind of thing? And as a sure. school board member, I'm like, no, we're not going to opt out. We're going to contribute data, right? Um, and it's good for our students to learn how to take tests and all that other stuff. But there's also a, a group of folks who, who feel like, let's just do as little testing as possible for our kids. So what I'm, the, the reason I said this, I want to know how we're doing on our participation percentages, yep. and does and are we seeing differences by cohorts there, and is that influencing our scores by cohort in terms of who's opting out? So uh, I have several answers-ish to that question. Number one, so what I'm looking at with this data right now is just raw spreadsheets. Absolutely. So and on there it doesn't say who opted out or who did. So I, I'm not particularly sure of that. There were several exempt or expired notifications which means one of several things. It means the student either started a session and didn't finish, mm. or didn't take the session. And I'm not sure, there were several of those, and we get a zero for each one of those. Um, but we get a, we get we get a zero. zero. <laughs> so they grade it as a zero, as yeah, opposed yeah. to just yeah. leaving it out. Yeah. So as, if they begin but don't finish? If they begin but don't finish. The you session. have the option of coming back to finish. So but I, I understand, that's important in the yeah. SBAC. But if they choose not to participate, it's not a zero. It is no, yes, it's zero. A zero. Yeah. Any child in our district who, in these cohorts that chooses not to opt, we get a zero averaged in. Correct. Yes. yes. So it's well, so that's interesting. There are other major. It's, it's a tragedy of the commons thing. There are. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, we if there was schools went into like panic mode when people started talking of opt out because yeah. they they can pull our funding. They can pull funding from us because right. of that. Who's they? The AOE. AOE. So, okay. so there's other there's other p consequences to that action. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it, but at the same time, this is an assessment. It's not the only assessment we look at. It's a big assessment to show not necessarily individual scores and what we can do with individual kids, but does our program match the rigor of the standards that, okay. that are out there? That's the that's the major overall First. question that we're yeah. asking. Um, and are we continually to increase our ability to meet that rigor? So a chart like this, you know, as, as a first timer to this district with Mike and I, that's a worrisome chart. You know, we, we need to flip that around. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's an assessment that, that for programmatic measures is important to us as a district. And as a board member, I think that would be a message that I'd want you to, to tell the public. The other thing ab about this is if, if you do no assessments, you everybody might seem happier but you have no idea then yeah. how everybody's doing so for the parents say I don't want so many assessments I don't want a lot of them but you have to have enough to determine whether your child is getting the information mm -hmm. you're presenting mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. and I think there's a perception okay. out there that the not only is testing not the complete assessment or perhaps the best assessment but I think there's also a fear that the teachers start teaching differently because of the assessment mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think communicating that that's not. But the we case. want them to, right? What, I well, I mean, we want them to teach, teach rigorous, but we don't want them to teach a test. We want them to teach. Mm -hmm. It sounds like we do. Actually, we. I think the we test. want to do well on the test, but we don't want them to teach to the test. Here's what I would have to do. I think we do. That's not a horrible test. No, it's a good one. We know. It's a good test. The SBAC is a pretty decent assessment. Believe me, I would be the first to tell you if I thought it was garbage. And we could say we want our children to know the questions, the answers to the questions that are on the test, yeah. right? Yeah, I would say the targets. Yeah, right. The <laughs> do you, so to ask, the, to ask this question, I mean, sure. in a more focused way, do you, it, is, I'm taking it from what you're saying, that there's information in the data that would lead to interventions in the teaching 
mm. process. Mm. For the individual. Well, yeah, the the, 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 the knowledge. I mean, looking at this just off, off, like our math scores were considerably lower. So what's happening in our math instruction? What kind of learning do we need to provide for our teachers in order to increase their capacity, to increase a kid's capacity to understand conceptual and math, you know? But are you asking about individual interventions? With, no, no, with just students? district. Okay. Well, it's district. Uh, this is district. district. We, we want to plan. We don't use the data to help help the individual students. So there's so the individual has no incentive. Not well. Think about it. When we get those assessment scores to the level that we need to intervene, it's too late. It, yeah, it's, yeah, it's not soon enough. It's more programmatic measures that we're looking at. Right. So it's useful. To, you're it's, it's, it's incredible. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah it's incredible. I, I think that's part of the it's issue here is to it, see it as right. It, this is part of being a good citizen in a community. Really, a lot of this is. And I mean, there is a benefit to the individual in that students do need to practice taking tests. It's it's a sad fact of life, and but it's true. And so, but it is a community contribution to data is really what we're doing. It's not helping your individual student at that moment or in that school year um, get a better education. It's, it's helping future students get a better education, and hopefully it's, it's having us understand what's going on with a continuation of curriculum and a continuation of effort over years. But I just, it's, I'm, not, I'm not saying tests, we take tests. It's not that, I'm just, I'm just answering questions that I hear regularly in the community about, look, our kids are, don't need to take tests, it's over-tested, you know? And, and SBAC is the least of our concerns in many ways. Um, but we have the what the kneecap still on the science. Are yeah, we still doing? Kneecap has changed. It's changing too, or it's changed. That's great. Was that this last, year? Last year was the first pilot year. On of what? Of the uh, science assessment. Okay. So, yeah, I don't even know what they're calling it. They're okay. calling it the science that's fine. assessment. That's fine. <laughs> and we assume it's moving more towards the SBAC kind of concepts, or it's more interactive. Yes. Interactive, yeah, at least. Okay. Driven, yeah. yeah. Okay. I've only seen it one time. And right. Um, it's on the computer. It's, yeah. it's SBAC like. Yeah. Yeah, and that one, that one is um, like that the state created? Um, and we're part of a consortium. Yeah, essentially yeah. it looks similar to what I believe Connecticut and Rhode Island have used mm -hmm. and a couple other states. I don't think that they created anything new per se, but it's new to us from DCAP. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd say about this is it does tell us cohorts, whether it's a grade cohort or a socioeconomic cohort that where we have a problem and then individually we can figure out when you say right. it's not helping the individual right. student. So the I'm year hoping or, that yeah. then there's a curriculum change which actually does help that student mm -hmm. in that cohort. The trend data is very important to us. It tells us a lot of information on multiple facets. Good. About the program and education. About program, yeah. about teacher quality, about <laughs> cohorts, of, I mean, there's so many different ways we can look at that data. We're, we're, I mean, we are really, ex I, I can't speak for everyone, but some of us on the board are very <laughs> excited about the quality of data we're hearing here, and we're yes. very thankful. And also the longitudinal data, the cohort data, the that sort of thing has been something we've been wanting for a long time, and we're really happy to hear that it's a priority for you. And as we break that down by, um, uh, by sub subpopulations, I think that's really important too, to the extent it can be done and not be identifiable. We are very excited about that. So thank you for this, and we do value data. Is I guess I want to leave that. It's super important. Thank you for doing it and keep yes. looking at it. <laughs> we will. When Mike says we geek out on it, we geek out. Good. On it. <laughs> and the longitudinal. Like, can we do it today? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, no data today. <laughs> Well, the longitudinal piece is the part that we're, I think we're dying to kind of hear if that's productive or if it's fruitful for you as you get into the data. I know we have small samples here, but as you can find truth in it. So, I just wanted, to, Nathan had, wants to say something. I'm, I'm resisting because I, I want to try to keep public comment to public comment. If it's, Ooh, nice. Huh? Nice. <laughs> Well, I, 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 I want to be mindful that there are you know, people who are not able to make it or participate who do have the, but um, if, if it's an urgent question, oh. go ahead, otherwise. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Well, <laughs> um, but you know, kind of from now on, that's going to be kind of protocol. All right, perfect. Thank you. <laughs> um, Great. Uh, policy readings. Um, I think we're moving around a pretty good clip here.
Uh, so we have five policies. Uh, do you think all of did all of them come out of the retreat? I think all of them did. Yeah. Um, well, not the retreat, the all day planning session. Yes, yes. all day mission. Uh, mission, vision, budgeting, board superintendent relationship, uh, board expectations, uh, and superintendent expectations. Um, so let's go start from the top and. Um, Good for the, for the people that weren't at our all day work session, um, the board came up with this, worked very hard to come up with this vision, and then began the idea of a mission. And I think where we are now is to decide, um, our superintendent had the suggestion that perhaps we have a district vision and that each school have their own mission. And so we did not have time to consider that. So before we spend any more time on the board mission, I think we need to talk about that. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, I have one. So you want to split it and have a separate discussion of the vision from the mission and the mission from the vision? No, actually, no. I think we've decided on the vision. That's yes. what I'm trying and, to confirm. And so that's, so that's, that's there. Okay. We've done it. Um, but now the question is, what do we do about this mission? What's the board's pleasure on mission? Yeah, I mean, one thing is, is it mutually exclusive? Can do we, we have a, a district vision and a district mission and then have each school also have their own particular mission? Okay. So one thing I noticed. You're looking at me. I'm, I'm not to decide this. This no, is no. a board decision yeah. to talk yeah, about. Sure. <laughs> I would just say this is less about whether it's school by school. I actually like the idea of each school having one very yeah. much. But that's going to happen regardless. That's going to happen regardless. Um, I don't get having a vision and a mission that are basically the same kind of thing. Like we, we basically were trying to write two different sentences that captured the spirit of what we were trying to accomplish in the district under two different labels. And so I think if we're going to have a mission, I don't. It, what they're called, I don't really. I don't really know what the right word is for. But if it's, I, I need a better understanding of what this is supposed to convey. That's different than the vision. And it, if it's just going to be another sentence that says something very similar, I'm not going to just, I'm not sure why we have had it twice. The vision is, is supposed it, is it more about values? Is it more concrete? Is it more Is it more directed? Maybe it more, I don't know, but I just, I need a better understanding. The of what vision is supposed to be the big picture, and the mission is supposed to be how you're getting there. Yeah. Well, as an outsider who was not part of that, just very briefly, I will say the mission adds only one thing, which is that it, that it focuses on the individual of the child with talents, passion, and passions. Um, and I think that it's basically talking about, I mean, this is just a brief reading. It says, it's basically saying that this is our, our method for getting to the vision, effectively. Or these are the values we instill in getting to this vision, but it could easily be wrapped into a vision and be done with it. And the re second half of this, to provide an education that empowers our graduates to build a better future, if we're not talking about empowering the individual for some reason, it fits right into engaged citizens and lifelong learners. So I don't know that that's even necessary. So that's just like, it looks a little bit redundant and it looks like it should all be combined into one. That was not part of the history of that. I Ryan. looked it up and it can, if I, if I, in, one, in one sentence it says, a vision statement outlines what a company wants to be in the future, a mission statement describes what a company wants to do now. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Then it should all be mission. Yeah. So. Would it be? Yeah, and I personally right. lean towards one. Um, though I do think we are going to have to be explicit about what we're calling it because the other policies that we have in front of us tonight refer back to I whatever it is. I circled it all in all the policies, so, so we have right. to make so a decision. Have, we have to call it something. Yeah, right. so we're we're going to have something. school <laughs> mentions and district missions, and like we need to make sure that we're explicit with what we're calling this, so our policies can refer back to. <laughs> this but i think i would personally lean more towards a single we'll just say vision for something for the discussion right now other comments so do we want to take an action to amend do you want to just take a big i want to ask a question then yeah. if you um 
maybe e even more helpful to the people who weren't there, is if you cover up the mission and just look at the vision, is that good enough? Or is it missing something? Do you care about first lines learning and the vision? That's what it does. It's saying. I think it's real close. It, you know, maybe our schools cultivate a caring, creative, and equitable community that ensures something that has it more forward facing. And I apologize, no, 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 I like was not there. So declarative that statement. Too late. I'm going to try to proceed on with this. So, so to say, I know it's hard, and it was hard for us then. But the question is, I'm not sure we put in time today to have this yeah. long discussion about this. But we would know what we want to do next if we could make a decision on that. In other words, if you think we'd just like one statement, but knowing you're just going to have one, this vision isn't quite it then we could decide on a process later that would get us there. Yeah. So my, my thought, reading the vision, I don't like the all our schools are. I, I think we should have it be aspirational, because I'm not sure our schools right now, I think we strive to be an equitable community. I'm not sure we're there. Um, yeah. I, I think it should be more aspirational than declarative. Okay, I'm yeah. going back to the question. I think I'm going to call the question of whether you want two statements or one. And then we could work on what the one is at a different time with a different protocol. It sounds like most people want one. I think, well, I think we most want people one want vision one. and then the schools can do their own. Should we take a, either yeah, make a motion on that or a, mm -hmm. a straw poll? I think a straw poll is enough because we're not adopting anything. It's yeah. a first right. reading, so. Yeah. So who wants to? edit out the mission and just go to the vision. I want one vision. I think I want one. Mm -hmm. okay. Steve, you're abstaining? Oh, or? No, I'm, I'm totally onto one and I'm, I've okay. just got to re it. <laughs> okay, so we'll, on another agenda of another time, rework it rework together. It. But my question is, are you calling it a vision? It's very important for the next four documents you're doing. <laughs> are you calling it a vision or are you calling it a mission? Becky, you were thinking a vision and have it be aspirational? Yes. Rather than whatever a mission is? A vision is what you want to be in the future. I think it a makes sense the at the board level so to have an aspirational statement. Yeah, yeah, that's my thought too. So we're calling it a vision and we'll get back to it and now you can go on to the other things. Okay. okay. Good. Thank you. So we will schedule a vision discussion on some aspirational point in the future. Uh, <laughs> budgeting. Um, budget policy. Comments, discussion on our this looks real familiar. Well it, in bullet number one, could you change mission to vision? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So we will do that throughout. Who's in charge of the edits? Are you, Jim? Huh? Are you in charge of the edits? I can I can be in charge of the edits. Okay. So this has the procedure and present. Is the procedure and format part of the policy, or is, will that be? Um, separate and procedure only. I think it's policy as procedure. I think we, because it's so pertinent to us. Okay. I think the idea w was to have it actually be part of the policy. You could actually well, call it a calendar, budget calendar, couldn't you? Instead yeah. of yeah. Budget procedure, procedure or budget procedure. process. Yeah, process. Yeah, process. Which is kind of synonymous with procedure, yeah. but. That's good. Before we get all the way down like into that section, the last statement in the opening section, the board will create and charge a finance committee to ensure oversight and accountability for the district's finances. I'm interested in potentially clarifying that it would be a standing committee versus an ad hoc. Mm -hmm. So we should maybe say charge a standing I think to have committee. standing finance committee, yep. 
That makes sense to me that we'd be clear. It should be. Yeah. Yeah. Could we call that middle section the annual budget calendar and process? Mm -hmm. Sure. To signal exactly yeah. what it is? Yes. Makes sense. What were you calling yeah, an annual, annual budget? Annual budget calendar and process. Um, which um, this How about procedure? instead of calendar, what do you call it? Schedule mm -hmm. or scheduling process. Okay. Because calendar suggests that we've actually set dates. At least it doesn't my mind. Are we setting dates? Huh? So will this be? Oh, we're, we're setting rough dates, but. So if we look That's in December, calendar. okay. So Jim, if you look in December, January, public hearing as set in budget calendar. Oh right, because there's. Is that really gonna, <laughs> Is that different than what we're doing right now? Because in, in September we'll have to adopt the actual calendar, calendar of what's so being done. Or, so maybe this is called a schedule, yeah. and the thing yeah. coming up with very specific is the calendar. The calendar. Yeah. yeah. So about annual okay. budget, just schedule. schedule. Yep. So. Just because we don't have enough on our agenda, um, <laughs> Brian and I were talking about on the way in that this standing finance committee for our new board needs a charge. I okay. don't know that we have one. Um, I don't think you'd have one either. Uh, I think when you give Peter's replacement, Brian and I are kind of informally trying to get a mm -hmm. grasp of what all our committees are. Okay. Um, and I know we also need to give you some help on negotiations. So um, I think either the 19th or the 3rd, we can probably do a committee red shuffle and, and give them all the needed charges. And OK. Thank you. Other questions on the budget policy? Just editing thing, the yeah, budget yeah. presentation format is on there twice, once not in bold. Oh, yeah. Um, and the capitalization is really uneven <laughs> throughout the <coughs> process. Yeah. I know we've talked about this in some of our last meetings. In May, the multi-year plan will be presented by the superintendent. I know we have a CIP, there's a multiple year plan here. I just wasn't sure if we're referring to the most appropriate plan or document. Um, since we're saying it will be presented, I wanted to make sure that we actually were presenting what does make sense for this. For a budget. Right. Did we discuss this? I, maybe I am misremembering, but did, I thought we discussed making this somewhat vague because it may. Yeah, I think that was what I It may yeah. vary, kind of depending on. Yeah, so, so we don't have. Mm -hmm. So future board can say, well, there needs to be a separate plan. The superintendent can say, well, that's the CIP plus our, yeah, plus our, yeah, plus our, you know, a capital plan, building plan. Um, right. We're not it gives making the superintendent it, discretion yeah. to. So that we're so not defining another on. one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. And the multi-year plan plans. might. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know how I love plans. The multi-year plan might be simpler than the CIP plan, which is very hard for the average else, community yeah. member to catch up with. Mm -hmm. So, it might be yeah. clear as pertains to the budget. Yes. Um, I had a question, and I was, I was responsible for trying to draft this during the meeting, so if it's wrong, it's my fault, but um, number two on the second page, when I was looking at it again for um, to prepare for today, I thought well, the one that says emphasizes cost efficiency measures, I almost mm -hmm. thought we had said to take that out. We did. At the retreat. Well, you were oh, at no, retreat. before the retreat. <laughs> yeah. We talked about it long before the retreat. <laughs> You're sure of that? <laughs> yeah, no, we, we've we been talking about it for six months. We did talk about taking that out. I think we talked about taking it out, so sorry. It stayed in somehow. Also, just as a formatting thing, we have kind of two sections of this. Well, actually, we actually have three sections. We have the introductory section where we've got bullets. We have the schedule section where we just have months listed. And then we've got the budget pres presentation format where we've got numbers. Numbers, it's right. It's uh, wonky. It's wonky. It's wonky. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that okay with folks? Do you want consistency or are we? 
Um, so we could turn the last one to bullets pretty easily, and then it would look similar. Should we, that's at least yeah. one thing. Um, I don't know, the dates don't seem to lend themselves to bullets, but we could at least yeah. hold the date or something. Do yeah. something to make it look Yeah. Mm -hmm. We could professionalize it. When you're working on those capitals. Yeah. Other issues, comments, questions, etc. Ooh, um, semicolon missing on four yep. in the presentation format. Yeah, the very opening sentence: the district's annual budget will. We need to insert B. Developed by the administration. Yeah. To board superintendent relationship. Questions, comments, edits. Under subjects of board's evaluation of superintendent, six line down, change mission division. Yeah. Can you bring the cut my attention? Section 1.2, last statement, the board must not direct the actions of district staff and must not formally evaluate any staff member. Other than to, the superintendent. Right. Do we need to declare formally? Because you wouldn't informally evaluate anybody. I mean, we're not going to evaluate anybody, period. Good. Correct? I mean, we're not going to, I mean, we could sit here and not write up a report, but we could say that we heard the seventh grade science teacher was doing a bad job and we're not happy about that. It wouldn't be a formal evaluation, but it could be. And the board should never. The board that. shouldn't right. be doing that. that. Board yeah. members. The board members. Yes. Yes. Discuss. Like, it just felt like formal. It, I don't know, I felt like maybe formally it was a little bit too restrictive in terms of like we don't evaluate in any manner. Right. Right. Like it was just yeah, simply we don't evaluate. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's right. It does clarify. Well Well, how about that. this? Um, you know, say we have an instance like we just talked about in our training where we do have to review whether or not an employee abused their discretion. Is it, that technically could be a form of evaluation. We've evaluated an action. Yeah, so but we it's haven't normal. evaluated it's job performance, but we've evaluation. evaluated an aspect of their performance, performance mm -hmm. in a certain context. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty narrowly defined. Yeah. And even in that case, then it is still the superintendent's position to do, conduct the actual evaluation, taking that into consideration as a participant. I think this also clarifies it for staff. Mm -hmm. So that a principal cannot come, for use an example, cannot come to a board member to lobby on their own behalf knowing the performance evaluation is coming sure. up, for example. Yeah. It makes the line very clear, I don't, which I think is a good there's thing. A, there's I a provision in discipline and dismissal below that has a nice way of saying it, except, it where, except where required by law or whatever it says. In other words, never unless you are required. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, you never evaluate. You do make sure the law is followed. 
Right. So something would come before us, as we just discussed, if someone was breaking the law. Well, right. It does involve the evaluating. In that lower, in 1.3, discipline and dismissal, it talks about yeah, evaluating. Yeah, legal obligations, but it had to do with, I, I think we're okay. I mean, we have no choice but to do what's asked of us. Right. When it's asked of us. But I, I think someone could technically say that we were evaluating, evaluating a, a job performance aspect of someone other than the superintendent in this situation. You know, I, I, now that I see the language you're pointing out, I'm thinking that these two sections are accomplishing different things. They're are somewhat right. overlapping, but 1.2 and 1.3. They're and unintentionally one, overlapping, yeah, I think. Yeah, one point two would probably say must not formally evaluate because that's what this section is about, formal supervision. Mm -hmm. We supervise the superintendent, the superintendent supervises everyone else, they do the formal evaluations. And then this is, you know, addressing the discipline and dismissal where it's clear that there can be sometimes a little no, obligation to be So maybe that was the purpose of the word formally? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what I, makes sense. I'm not sure. I know that I didn't come up with the word formally. That either came from the policy governance language or from the VBA policy. So I'm just, the VSBA policy. But I'm just guessing that maybe it says formal because this section is about mm -hmm. sort of formal the structure. mm -hmm. structures. Okay. But, I'm more wondering I'm why, why the concept of evaluating is then restated lower. In other words, it's basically giving permission to evaluate employees in 1.3 discipline and dismissal. It's saying there are circumstances under which we will be evaluating employees. No, we may be participating in decisions or actions that involve evaluating. Okay. But we're not conducting okay. a formal okay. evaluation, which is a thing, a formal evaluation. So a leading versus participating thing. in? Conducting no. a formal evaluation versus having some role to play in a process. Right. That you First, that yeah. So con formally evaluating is conducting? I'm not, I'm not sure where you get the idea of conducting. Must not formally evaluate. I sort of read that as, as the conducting. board does not, as an entity, okay. conduct the evaluation of employees. And that's, that section is kind of setting up that whole supervisory structure. And participate in decisions and actions involving implies to me there's been an evaluation. And now mm -hmm. yeah. the board is asked to participate in decisions and actions based on. And that, and that too yeah. rarely happens, but there are some circumstances where right. it doesn't. Yeah. Well. I just think the idea of conducting versus something that's formal or not synonymous. That's what I'm concerned about. And I like conducting. I think that's appropriate. And I don't know what formal means. So I um, did receive a, just a notice from a member of the public that they are not able to find these documents online. So I just want to. These policies? Yeah. We, be, we haven't adopted them yet. Would the. The packet. Yeah, the, the packet be online for so people can review if they're read and. So do we put the packets online traditionally? Oh, okay. The agenda. Agenda. I think it's possible to be used because you know part of the purpose of the readings is to have the public given the, yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. Yeah. So anything in the packet that doesn't re relate to personnel personnel would could go online. There's a question mark after that. What we do. This is still the very first reading. This is still discussion. So there's still several readings coming. Yeah. Yes. So yes, there's nothing, there's still plenty of time for the public to weigh in on all the drafts. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think it is legitimate if, you know, unless you're, yes, it doesn't matter to the public unless you're sitting here, even if you're sitting here listening to it, you're not sure what we're yeah, talking probably. about, so. Yeah. Um, Let me check on that. Okay. So Let me I would. check on that though, because it's the board's responsibility to make pu policy. What, what I'm questioning is, is that the public has voted you all in to create these policies. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so that's what I'm quite. So let me just check. Okay. And I would say it's a matter of it's just sort of like having a packet here. If you come in, and are going to listen to us, and we've talked for two hours about something you have no documents on, it's not very much fun. 
And so um, it, that would be the same thing. If you're home and listening to us online, it would be nice to know what we're talking about. But if that's the case, then everything ought to have a draft on it. Because if I go to the site and see this yeah. policy, I might get yeah. myself all in a twit about something that's, as you yeah. just said, are three drafts away. Right. So, yeah. And I've had community members tell me before, and it's like, so you as a board member, well, in Roxbury, we're policy governance, you manage by the board, you don't tell the superintendent to do this, you have policy that directs. Will you please write a policy that includes <laughs> <laughs> language that would accomplish this? Yeah. So I think people are interested in having us Absolutely. as a conduit to policy. So. Well, I mean, my thought is, um, you know, I absolutely agree that you know, we make the policy and we set the policy and we're elected to do that. But, you know, part of the reason of having the various readings discussions and having public comment is if the member of the public um, reads a policy we're considering but has not adopted and has concerns or questions they want to bring to the attention of the board, um, that's their opportunity to do so. Uh, we don't necessarily have to listen to them, but otherwise they don't have a meaningful opportunity to, to do that. Be engaged. And we want to be inclusive, as inclusive yeah. as practical, which we understand that there's a bureaucratic burden and cost to being super productive in terms of documents. So we want to be sensitive to that. But in general, more is better. Yeah. It's also just as a practical matter, they're public records, and so if someone asks for them, they need to we'd be have to provided. give them. It's much easier to just post they're them, post yeah. so that no one has to ask for them. Yeah. It would just be easy. I mean, most of our facts are pretty small. I mean, you might just be able to scan them as a PDF and tag that on the. Well, there were the documents, so should, they can just be attached, right? Yeah. As to what? Well, you mean post, like you mean post, post it. Link yeah. to it's the always better in PDF because that yeah. the outside party cannot alter the text. Mm -hmm. Unless you have yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now we're beyond policy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, sorry. I, um. Good point. Whoever brought it up. <laughs> Was there anything else on that? So what did you, what did you decide about that? Oh right, we didn't about the word decide. Formally? I was distracted by the. Yeah. Um, why don't we just take, must not evaluate. So formally, it confuses things, and I'm not sure it accomplishes anything. Okay. I didn't have a good example for an informal evaluation, but it just yeah, it caught my attention. Yeah, so. so now I'm back to the, well, then the next one is the contradiction. I realize it doesn't, but it does, right? It's, I don't think it does. I don't think it does. One, one is, is, one is, which, one is which like, evaluate, and the other is just putting in a decision that involved it. Yeah. OK. No, I, I think one is, you know, we don't sit down and evaluate the performance of employees, but there might be a, a, you know, a disciplinary action or some sort of action where we're required to review a decision that was made based on an evaluation. We are allowed under 1.3 discipline to participate in a, to participate in a decision in evaluating an employee. No, no uh, decisions not. or actions involving the, the evaluating. Evaluation. If it's required by law or negotiation. Yeah, uh, that part I understand, but participating in a decision involving, I mean, there's a lot of words there, uh, or actions involving the evaluating is the same as participate in evaluating. It does not. No, it's not. In okay. Because someone could come up, come up, could come up and complain about their evaluation and a disciplinary action based on their evaluation. We could actually be evaluating the evaluation in. Okay. Our decision, yeah, you know, if it's required, but we won't do the actual evaluation. We won't sit down with Principal X and say, you know, great job or bad job based on whatever data. That's not our job. You ready to move on, Steve? Okay, then. I put formally back in at that point. But I think it's it's better than. Redundancy, but or okay. better than con contradiction, but you guys, I'm, I'm fine to be, you know, on the scale of one to ten, I care about a three on this. So let's okay. <laughs> let's go four. Okay. Um, more comments on the board superintendent relationship draft policy. You good? Okay. okay. Uh, board expectations. 
And this one I think has the most uh, new sections added that were not talked about. At the right, and I think before we jump into the full discussion, there most of the new additions aren't included in the draft that was sent out in the packet. Um, well, not most, but yeah, I apologize. The board committee section, section F, I did fill in, but I didn't realize, I didn't read the section in the packet because I thought I knew it was coming. <laughs> Um, so I didn't realize it today until that that board committee stuff was not included. Um, right, so there was some more information related to the other board officers, the vice chair, the record keeper, et cetera. Um, it's not included in this. Obviously, the stuff that's in front of us now the, is the same. It was just there are some additions that aren't included in this draft. Um, so there would still be more stuff forthcoming for another discussion that would, yeah. yeah. Um, so did you want us to discuss what's here now? I, the stuff that is here, we could, yes. Um, I don't think, right, the sections that are in front of us are up to date. It's just that there are still, like I really did flesh out the board committee sections. Um, there's a lot more details in terms of standing ad hoc, what's required for us in terms of charges, durations, um, reports, et cetera. The same thing, we didn't have anything related to the other offices. Um, we have a vice chair, we've elected a parliamentarian, record keeper, et cetera. We didn't have anything in regards to their duties. So when we really fleshed out the board chair duties, I included the other officers in there as well. Um, so yes, the information that is in front of us now is up to date with the exception of the stuff that's been accidentally omitted. You should get to do that. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So folks, I mean, other than the inclusion of that next time. Um, comments on the expectations draft policy. Um, yeah, sure. We've never had this much detail about the chair's role before. Oh. And I wondered if some of it is really the kind of material we should have in a policy. Um, uh, you know, I mean, things like the chair is expected to be a strong advocate for the district. Um, and then some of the stuff around, you know, is that, it's just it's weird, isn't it? It's, yeah, it seems a little weird to me in a policy. It's more sort of, you know, how to be a board chair. Um, did this come, and where did this come from? Did this come from a lot of yeah. This SBA. was, it was a combination, so the sections regarding like you're talking about the advocacy, et cetera, that was information from the VSBA for best practices for board chair. Um, it wasn't in policy, it was just, we had used, I had used it to kind of structure the responsibility of the chair. Yeah. yeah, so the VSBA would say that a board chair's primary role is the team building, goal setting, agendas, and running meetings effectively. Um, the community stuff as well, but that was the VSBA's framework for this is how a good board chair operates and how it accomplishes board work successfully. In practical terms, the way a board chair functions effectively is that they remember that they, are, they serve at the pleasure of their other members of the board and that they check in with the board informally constantly to make sure that they are representing that their leadership represents the uh, the desires of their of the other folks on the board they don't have to and so what I'm saying is that there may want to be a statement about the fact that the board serves at the pleasure or the chair serves at the pleasure of the board I mean ultimately that is the most important political point about being a chair and under community it does say um, though the chair can speak for the board, the chair cannot act independently and direct any actions by themselves. And in practical terms, that's the result. As soon as you act independently, you lose your chair. Your chair. But it's it's one of those things that you see. That, you know, a good chair just simply says, "Am I solid all the time?" So you know, this is a good document. Yeah. 
It is it is a bit verbose. Yeah, I, I, I think it's helpful. There's a lot of good stuff in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the meeting, some of these things I'm not sure we do. Um, I don't know what uh, to enforce the rules relating to debate. It's, that's a Robert's rules. That's a Robert's right. rules. Sounds like yeah. Which section um, are you in right now, Bridget? Excuse I'm in the meetings. Protect the board from obviously dilatory motions by refusing to recognize them. Ooh. If he gets that mad was, at us, that, 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 that was probably not have to be mentioned. The stage will walk out when necessary. Yeah. <laughs> and I wasn't sure about the authenticating by a signature, if that's even something that, that is a power of a school board chair. There are times, there are documents, and Jim, you know better than I would, that the board chair does sign off yeah. on things. I can't give you a specific yeah. example, but More I do know than that I previously thought. <laughs> <laughs> but are those, are those and it'll be only your on? name on it, even though work. Steve yeah. says you're representing uh, the board. You do that for, on behalf of the board, not on the yeah. di district, because you don't need to do it for. It, it's not always exciting stuff, but it's no? done. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's a good document. It clarifies a lot of things. Yeah, no, this is great work around. Um, on D1, I would like to advocate that if we're going to have that section, that we should have the exact language of 312H yeah. and not, which okay, the exact language. Creating a new right? <laughs> yeah, the exact language is at an open meeting, the public shall be given a reasonable opportunity to express its opinion on matters considered by the public body during the meeting as long as order is maintained public comment shall be subject to reasonable rules established by the chair you're looking at e1 I'm, well, I'm D, looking D1. D1. Oh, D1. d1 sorry yeah. so that's what yeah. that statute actually says um, yeah. Okay. I said I'm fine with that. That's yeah, section 312. Yeah. That's section 312H, yeah. which is what's cited mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So get rid of the summary and just put in the actual statute. It's just sort of, because it says open meeting law, I, that would be my I think that's opinion. really smart. It's just put it there. We don't try to create something that isn't true or isn't yeah, well, already established. Or, if it's already what is the tape or videotape the... So I looked into that a little bit, and Ryan and I talked just, about it. Um, I don't see that. Anyone use tape that. or videotape anymore? Oh, right. Does anyone use that? <laughs> they can record it. I don't see that in the in the statute where you could cite it. Jim Condos, the Secretary of State, has, says on their website that they construe the law to allow taping or videotaping of meetings. I can't think of any reason why it wouldn't be permissible to record a public meeting as long as you're not disrupting the yeah. procedure. But it's. I don't think it actually says that anymore. Open meeting law. So we could, I mean, we could add it to the poli to the policy to be clear that we're fine with it. I agree. Maybe record is better than video. Too. Yes. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. I don't know if it belongs in here. Um, participation in board meetings. Um, and it's it's kind of a personal concern is is the issue of participation in board meetings from afar, and how do we want is that a, is that something we should we should be clear in policy or is it simply something the board just kind of does on an ad hoc basis? But through technology limitations, it's often felt as if it's virtually impossible, even yes. though we also say that we do it. Um, those of us who've tried to do it kind of give up after a while. Um, it's very and it's not that big of an investment in technology to actually make that work, but it requires, I think, the board to either value it or not value it. I don't know if a board member has, an, has a statutory right to it. I don't, I don't, think, I don't so. think so. So maybe, maybe not, but I'm sure the board itself can establish the procedures around that. And I don't know how that gets done or where that gets done, but I would just say that as a board, at some point, we should make a decision about whether we're going to create the environment that allows that or not. Because it, right now, it just feels like I'm out of luck if I if I'm traveling, which I don't want to be. I want to be participating. So should we? I, I feel the same way. I, I, yeah. I've seen you try to get, <laughs> yeah. call in. Um, 
And I also just feel it's something that the technology exists and uh, there's a lot of entities out there that take advantage of it. Um, yeah, some of the video stuff's a little more clumsy, but certainly mm. good audio participations. Maybe a, a line, you know, reasonable measures shall be taken to allow for uh, accommodate. Yeah, audio or virtual attendance by board members who are unable to be physically present. Well, so then the question I have to say, also having tried it, is reasonable. So I, said, I think reasonable. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, what is that? And often, if you're this, away and it's just audio, in this day and age, putting me up on a Google video is so super easy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've presented that way to yeah. boards before, so it's. Yeah. You could it's have a big easy. Steve head on the, exactly. on the wall. I guess it's going to be my question. Is, is that technology not something? It doesn't require a financial investment. Oh, gotcha. No, no. We, already have it. No. <laughs> we are in Google world. It requires <laughs> the imagination Very easily. as of July I think 1. A part, part of this, Libby, is we just, it's not that we couldn't, we haven't done it well. So the we question. can do it very easily. I mean, my other thought on that is it's. It's such an easy problem to solve that do we really need a policy? No, and I don't. I'm not saying we do. I just, I just maybe was getting a sense. I want to get a sense from the board whether the board feels it's I would, something I, worth tr trying to accommodate or not. And I yes. don't. I wouldn't be insulted yes. either way. It's more a matter of let's just get it clear so we can move on, kind of a thing. Yeah, I, I think you know, given you know, you travel a lot. I travel a fair amount. You know, Bridget and others travel too. Um, it's, it's, a, it's. I think it's. It's something we can do. It's something we should do, and it. It will increase participation, and you know, we, we might have a quorum problem at, at some point. Um, well, I, I think that's we what I was going to say. It's a philosophical discussion about. Mm -hmm. It's not here, but in some boards, they used to say, "You miss two meetings, you're out." Yeah. Or you, you know, they used to write down how many meetings. So, but what does missing mean? Are you here? Is it a quorum? Yeah. If you're here on Google Docs, but, well, yeah, I mean you can you can have yeah. meaningful yeah. participation yeah. and it does follow along yeah. virtually. Yeah. yeah. So that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. a philosophical. Especially when you first started speaking, I thought you were going to talk about um, the technology to allow the public to interact more with us mm. at the meetings. It's yeah. another level of it. Yeah. Yeah. So it is another part of that discussion. But you can call Jim. Uh, we, did, we got it tonight. Yeah. Maybe yes. there's a, a general consensus or a consensus that, or something that we want to use technology in general to increase participation in every way we can. We don't want to create, you know, finan big financial burdens, or and that includes staff time um, to make that happen. But if it's easy to access, we should start to think that way about using technology to increase participation in every way. I don't need a time check. We are 25 minutes. Over. Okay, so we're not going to put it in here. I, no, but we ought to try it. I think I, we don't need to put it in the policy, but we ought to give it a try. I, I think That's we should true. make a board commitment to okay. get it up and get it running. And I think once we make ourselves, yeah. I don't think it's that hard. I think once we do it a few times, get a little we'll get a system down. A more. Yeah, um, and you'll probably you covered, thank you so much. Be one of the the, the first. Um, okay, last one: superintendent expectations. Uh, Comments or questions on the reading of this policy? I've got to fix the numbering. Hands are technology. There's two of them over there. Editing this one, Jim? I'm, I'm just making notes. Um, notes of edits on all of them, and then I, I give them a little bit of Heather. Mm. Okay, yeah, keeping. The, the numbering. Unless so we're actually editing them. Them. <laughs> 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 well, at least the. They're, they're minor edits. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll ask one question 2.2, number six. Again, I don't know much about contract law. But proposed contracts to provide flexibility to remove non-unionized non employees for cause. Is cause the best term to use there? Was performance or is 
Uh, that's cause a legal is a term. term. It is. Is that the best? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You could also say just cause, but cause is your right word. I kind I think of thought there. so, but it was something I'm not terribly familiar with, and it seemed yep. a little bit odd. So I just wanted to yep. get some verification. Cause is a there. very well established word in law. In contract yes. law. Yeah. I'm just really happy about 2.13 foster district culture that is open and responsive to the concerns of stakeholders. To me, that's a really wonderful, positive, aspirational statement in there that just makes me want to do a happy dance. Mm -hmm. We have some mission vision issues in this one. <laughs> Since we don't have one. It says, um, so. 2.0 global expectation at the last part of the first paragraph says in a manner that does not violate the mission and core values of the district. Mm. We had all debates about that. Oh, right. mm -hmm. Did we decide to leave it in even though we don't have values? We even started we talking about whether we wanted to have that. You wanted to have values or not. That was an unanswered question. It was an unanswered question. Mm -hmm. Because we had the, we had a list before. We did have we had a list before, and then so yes. that's another but question we have to decide. Is won't those be more in like the ends? Our values go in our ends. I guess not. Ends are what we achieve. Values are how we live. Right. And we, we were avoiding through. using the word ends. Yeah. But still, so like we are referring to something here, and what is that? <laughs> we do two things. That Plus, right. it could we be consistent that. with commonly accepted business. And professional ethics and practices, and with achieving progress toward the district's vision. Yeah, it's going to say in, yeah. in a manner that advances the vision of the district. Yeah. It does not violate because it's back in the negative right. world. That's kind of cool. You want to stick with core values? I'm no. hesitant to have it in there if we don't have it. Yeah, if we don't have it, yeah, because then it's. No, it's just. Division. It's going to include the district. Yeah. yeah. Which should represent your values. Yeah. And your policies, which are down. And it's it's All also continues to speak like in the positive rather than in the negative. Yeah. In this way, it's like continues to aspire and. So, but yeah, we needed. We didn't really resolve this. It's it's the same thing in the last sentence of two point zero that we had this value language. That can be deleted. So it's deleted. Vision, uh, it can values. be deleted. And then it says link. Wait, to the didn't we just do, didn't we just state that though in the the way we re, redid 2.0? Yeah, I think I think we can just get rid of that line. It's kind of now established because in a manner that advances the vision of the district and must lead and manage in a manner that adheres to and reflects the district's vision. Hmm. Now, or I'm wondering if we should cut the first, cut the first there you go. clause and leave this because I kind of like leading. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because mm -hmm. they're, they're two different ideas. They're two different ideas. Yeah. yeah. So, so we could cut two we off after ethics and practices. Yeah. Okay. And then leave that last one in Good work. with vision instead of values. That, that what? So it, it adheres to and reflects the district's vision. Cool. some pretty mm -hmm. high uh, bars here. But the superintendent must employ best practices for retention of staff. I mean, That's actually not new. I think it just used to say the superintendent must not fail to employ. Best practices was in there? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's get Let's fall more. short. Huh? I mean, if it's it doesn't, the fact that it was there before Absolute, doesn't mean it has to be there now. Not second best practices. These <laughs> are <laughs> the best practices. You guys have a list of those, so I'm clear. <laughs> right, right. Where do I see that list? No. Bridget, you know, I don't think I remember noticing this in other policies. Have we referred to policies in the past as district policy or board policy? It's, it's totally inconsistent at this point. Yeah, we made a decision as a retreat at some point that we're we going to start going to policy. district policies. Okay. Yes. I but so. well, we haven't gone back and fixed that. Because there are no, right. are no other policies for the right. district, other right. than board policies. Which are right. Which are district right. policies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
clear. I think I have a note on that. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, I'm sorry I missed this before, but we've completely gotten away from that that standard of that the superintendent that the board is judging that the superintendent shall be the judge of these things. You, I, I can't remember how that's worded. No, we're not completely away from that. The judge of what thing? Yeah, and the board superintendent relationship. Yeah, that's policy. what. That's where I was missing it. It says that the superintendent in managing the district is under superintendent's discretion. The superintendent has discretion to use any reasonable interpretation of the district's policies. Okay. The board must respect and support decisions made by the superintendent that reflect a reasonable okay. interpretation. That's where. Best practice for staff retention. Yeah. Okay. In including that's why I was just seeing how that ties together because you need a, you need a, a standard to judge things by. Yeah. So that's fine. That's the no second guessing line. Well, yeah, it's, it's that very high standard decision. of that right. is totally not reasonable. Yeah. It's that's the standard. Yeah. Okay. Because we have all new terribly clear policies, so yeah. she knows exactly what yeah. to do. Look at her. Are we okay? Yeah, um, the only other thing is emergency superintendent secession. Um, I think we discussed this, maybe decided against it, I'm misremembering. Um, she has something in there about just not ensuring that the uh, administrator designated as potential interim successor is aware of that designation, but that the board is aware of the designation too. Or at least the board chair is aware of the designation. That's fine. Huh? Uh, it, 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 and therefore, the board should be aware, right? Yeah. But the, What's the, the, the duty from the superintendent can be fulfilled by telling me with the idea that I tell all of you. And it, it stands until it's changed? It's done at least yeah. annually and then it stays? Oh, well, there have been, you know, should something happen to the superintendent where, you know, this succession is quick and unplanned. Um, I win the Powerball. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, many other things that may occur. We don't have to We don't have to staff members fighting for the You could add yeah. we're, we're administrator add designated as a potential is and after that before the is and the board chair. Yes. The superintendent must ensure the administrator designated as the interim yes. successor yes. and the board chair is and aware. Are aware. Are aware. Are. Sorry. Oh, well, except then the then. Oh right, then it's not a. Yeah, the change. So oh, it's reasonably proficient. The potential proficient. interim successor is reasonably proficient. And how about this? Sentence. How about and that the potential interim successor is reasonably proficient for the role? Get rid of that comma and is reasonably familiar with the board and superintendent issues. I think it's just be another sentence. Yeah, you're yeah, right. It's, we tried okay. to put too much into that sentence. So it's just a period the superintendent must also ensure. Is there, is there a responsibility that this person, I mean, I guess you're, the superintendent is appointing this person whether they like it or not. Ultimately. Well, they have to be willing. No, no. Okay. Okay. And okay. they have to be told. Oh, I see it there. I'm sorry. Yeah. Willing to serve. Okay. Well, they can be told, but that doesn't make them willing, but willing makes them willing. Yeah. Well, it's... So the second two sentences have, the superintendent must ensure that, that an administrator designated 
as potential interim successor and the board chair are aware of that designation, the potential interim successor must be reasonably proficient for that role and reasonably familiar with the board and superintendent issues. So what's capable mean? It means that they have time? I think it means that they have the skill set. Right. Yeah. And we discussed at the retreat it doesn't require licensing yeah. because that's, right. that's not typically necessary. Yeah, you know, I mean, they, they probably yeah. wouldn't have time. So They'd probably be someone yeah. with another full time yeah. job who's going to have to really step time. out of that job. I'm just wondering why it has to say reasonably proficient for the role if they have to be capable. I wouldn't choose a teacher or an IA who doesn't yeah. have administrative experience. But they're capable. Have to be somebody with administrative experience. Yeah. I would imagine that that's what that means. Someone who can okay. step in and yeah. Okay. Okay. Other questions or comments? Only forty minutes over. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, members, of uh, members of the public are hanging in there. Members of the public are hanging in there. Nine is a pretty common adjournment. I think it's right. The last one wouldn't get done. That's great. Yeah. We'll do that. Perfect. Um, you can let me know if you want to do that. Good by notes, we should be okay. Good by notes, we should be okay. Sure. I loved all of the first day of school stuff. The presence on social media. Was great. Yes. The memo, the weekly memo. Yes. Was great. Yes. Getting a copy of what you share with the staff was really interesting yes. to see. So just a, a kudos to on all of those fronts. Good. Thanks. Yeah. No, thank you for saying that. Fantastic. Thanks to everyone it's in the district great, for a great start to the school. Great, great communication. Yeah. Yes. I heard from parents great things about yeah. their how pleased they were with the start of the school year. Good. And, and unions looking good, and that's not an easy feat to pull off right now. Yep. And stay tuned very shortly for a picture of the vestibule that we oh, got today. Oh, good. The colors and everything. Nice. Yeah, everybody. Nice. Fantastic job. It's just just a great start. How, um, so, how, how I didn't think about this, but the email I sent about how are we doing with Roxbury, um, how are we doing? I don't, can I, I just, that was not a question that was appropriate. Agenda, right? Well, I think we talked, we've talked about not putting people on the spot without. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, warning that someone's yeah. going to come up. So I, I don't no. want to cut off Jim or the superintendent, but I just want to say. I thought Jim said we would hear that. That's why I asked it. Well, okay, you we'll ask, do it later. You, yes. <laughs> I can answer them. Yeah. <laughs> Some of them are quick. Do you want me to just answer the quick, quick ones? It's up to Jim. Yeah. Go ahead. So the food situation right now is that, so Tina asked um, how food was getting to Roxbury. So currently, um, Jim and the kitchen staff here in Montpelier are cooking this, at the high school are cooking the students' food and then um, busing it, basically trucking it over to, to Roxbury until October. The reason being is that um, the hood project got messed up in the kitchen so what the hood is being installed in October and once that's installed we can use the stove over there and all that kind of stuff so everything's pretty much ready to go except for the hood um, so we have so then will they cook there. there yes oh good yes they will cook there um, I'm try just trying to remember and how's right the busing going the busing the busing is a, is um, I would chalk it up to first days of school kind of busing challenges that most places experience the bus from Roxbury to the Main Street middle has been about 15 minutes late every day um, so it's something that we're talking to the bus company about do do we want to change the route so it's not going directly through you know middle of Montpelier at a time that's very busy for traffic so we're trying to work out some snafus around that I mean there's their first day issues that happened um, some of it was merger related some of it was just first day school re related um, so so we're working on trying to get that there 15 minutes earlier than it is currently showing up. Yeah, and I do just want to reiterate for kind of poor decorum, and, and I know that you did send an email on this, so that <laughs> got lost in the mix. But um, let's let's try to you know stick to the agenda yeah. to the extent we can, and you know read stuff beforehand, ask ask questions by email uh, beforehand, so uh, yeah, either can be if it's a simple question can be answered um, or. 
you know, if it's something that needs to be discussed, there's preparation for it. Yeah, and um, Heather and I are getting those packets yeah. together on Friday morning, so any questions for the next Wednesday board meeting should be to maybe for Friday, so we can get it in the stuff, get it in the packets. Thank you for those answers. Yeah, and if there is an email that was overlooked and it's something that we could wait with or something. Um, okay. Yeah, ping us after the meeting and, and um, Adjourn. And we do need to formally adjourn. Move adjourn. Okay. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.